five, four, three, two, one. What's up, J-Vox? All right. All right, all right. Hey, um, so we are starting our Christmas series today. We are, um, we're not even, we're not even a month to Christmas. We're still like a few days short of a month away from Christmas. But real quick, I, I just want to hear, what is everybody's favorite part of Christmas? Favorite, say, yeah, Tegan. Presents, okay. Food, Mia. Being around family, Josh. Family, Julia. Family, oh, so many good, like, family answers, McKenna. Getting out of Florida, vacation, yeah. Food, oh my gosh. All right, hands down, food is my favorite. But here's the thing, um, nobody said, nobody said um, waiting. Like, nobody said that their favorite part of Christmas was waiting. But here's the deal, isn't there a ton of waiting that goes into Christmas? Like, like as soon as, as soon as, depending on your family, um, either, either like as soon as Halloween ends or maybe as soon as Thanksgiving ends, Christmas music starts playing, you feel, right? Uh, or some of you started back in February, right? And you're just waiting for, some of you, uh, some of you maybe you had, you had a Christmas list that you made of things that you wanted and then you're waiting, right? You're waiting for it to come. Right, um, and so there's a there's a ton of waiting that goes into Christmas, and I want to talk to us today about how awesome waiting can be, because the reality is most of us don't like the idea of waiting when you're told to wait. Nobody likes that. Like um, my family went on vacation uh, a couple years ago, and we took we took the kids to Disney. And, um, and we went to uh, Animal Kingdom, okay? Anybody been to Animal Kingdom? Okay, it was my first time ever. Um, we went to Animal Kingdom, and they have, they have the whole world of Avatar Pandora, right? Um, so they've got Pandora, which has, like, floating rocks. I mean, it just has, like, the, the, the floating mountains and all kinds of crazy awesome stuff. So here's the thing. We... We wanted to, um, we wanted to get, yeah, I mean, Pandora is awesome. Now, here's the deal. This, this is the big part of the reason that you go to Animal Kingdom, because in Pandora, they had just opened a new ride, and it was this ride. It was like the flight of the, not the hippogriff, whatever that is, you know what I, what? Flight of passage, there we go. All right, so flight of, they had just opened this ride, and I remember we got there before the park opened, and as soon as the park opened, we went right for Pandora. We went right for it, and we went to look, and as we came up to this ride, there was, a, right, this is like, this is like, I don't know, 8.30 in the morning, okay? There's a three and a half hour wait. No, wait, wait, wait. This, as soon as the park opened, as soon as the park opened, you are not going to get on there for three and a half hours. If you, start, if, if you spent the first half of your day in Disney, you would be waiting for one ride. Now, here's the deal. You could watch the Avatar movie before you would finish the ride, right? You could watch the entire movie in the line, right? You could do that, and it's just crazy amount. And so here's what we did. We were like, no way. There's no way. That's a crazy long line. We're... We'll, we'll, see, we'll see what it's like later. Literally, we kept watching. We kept watching it. And as the day went on, it went from like three and a half hours, three hours and 45 minutes, four hours, four hours and 15 minutes, four and a half hours until they just shut down the ride. And they just said, all right, nobody else can get in line. Right? I mean, it was just this crazy, crazy, and people were waiting all the way to the end. Yes, sir. They were right in. They probably had like a park hopper. They went right in. Or not park hopper. You know what I mean. They went right in. But here's the deal. Here's the deal. When you're waiting, sometimes that waiting feels painful, right? And you're just like, oh, my gosh, I don't want to wait. I don't like this. I don't, I don't enjoy this. But 
But there's some kinds of waiting that are incredible, that build hope. And we want to talk this morning about hope. Everybody say hope. We want to talk about hope this morning because this is a big part of what, um, uh, of what God wants for us, his people. See, the reality is that when we come into Christmas, most of us are thinking about, we're thinking about um, presents, we're thinking about um, baby Jesus, you're thinking about, um, you're thinking about like the songs of which you don't even understand what it means, you know, um, you're like a partridge in a pear tree, you don't know what any of that is. You've never seen a pear tree. You don't know what a partridge is, right? Like, I mean, just like it's all mystery. And yet, like, we're just, we get excited about these things. But there's a word that pops up this time of year that Christians, and it's called Advent. Say Advent. How many of you have heard that word before? Okay, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Because here's the thing. You've probably seen, like, an Advent calendar somewhere, right? Um, these calendars, they pop up, and essentially it's like, and most of them are like this thing where like you open one thing a day and it builds up to Christmas. Like um, like we got our kids a Lego advent calendar, and, and so like every single day they would open a thing and it'd be a new Lego, and at the end you get like Baby Yoda, right? You get like the end, and he's like, it's not even Baby Yoda, he's wearing like a Christmas onesie. You know, like just uh, everybody, aw. Yeah, like, I mean, it just like, and it builds toward, it builds towards 24. Now, some of these are really cool. Some of these are really lame. Like, there was one that I saw, and it was 24, um, it, and it, it, it was candy, but it wasn't candy. It was candy-scented candles. And so every day, every day, instead of eating candy, you just get to smell the candy that you can't eat. That's just, yeah, full, that's just so disappointing. Anyway. Most of us, you've probably heard the word Advent before, but you probably don't know what that word means because it's not an English word. It's a word from Latin. And in Latin, the word Adventus means coming or to, to come or somebody is arriving. Like when Jesus came to earth, it was his Advent. So when we, talk about, when we talk about Christmas, we're talking about the time that Jesus uh, advent to earth, right? He came to earth. He was coming. But what we don't think about often is that there were many people who spent year after year after year waiting for Jesus. See, if you have a, if you have a Bible, you've probably noticed that there's two parts in it. There's uh, one part called the New Testament, and it begins with Jesus, and it begins with his life on earth, and it talks about um, what he did here, how he died, how he came back to life, and then how, um, how people became the church and what they did at first. And that's the New Testament of the Bible. But, but the, the bigger part is called the Old Testament, and the Old Testament is full of everything that God had interacted with people before Jesus. It's everything that God had wanted to communicate with people before Jesus came to the earth. But do you know what's crazy? That's thousands of years. By the way, the Old Testament is thousands of years. It covers thousands of years of time, okay? It's a crazy long time that this is going. But literally... In the very beginning of the Bible, in fact, there's a verse in Genesis 3 where God promises to all people that one day he's going to send a son who will destroy the enemy, Satan. And at the very beginning of the Bible, he promises, hey, one day I'm going to send a son who will destroy Satan. How many of you would be excited if Satan was done away with, right? Just, all right, good, good. That's an easy one to get behind, right? If you're hesitant on that, let's talk. Right, like, but from the beginning of the Bible, God promised this. I'm going to send a son, and he's going to come. And, and then he, he promises so much more. He promises that one day, one day he's going to, um, 
He's going to send a son who would take away our sins. Isaiah 53 verse 11 says, because of his experience, my righteous servant will make it possible for many to be counted righteous, for he will bear all their sins. Isaiah writes this 700 years before Jesus comes. And he prophesies. Essentially what that means is God told him something that hadn't happened yet. He's telling us the future. And he says, in the future, there's somebody who is going to come, and he's going to take everyone's sins away. And he promises this. But here's the crazy part. For thousands of years, people spent their Christmas waiting for a Jesus who hadn't come yet. Waiting for the day that God would send his son to earth there are so many people who instead of, instead of celebrating like the baby and making a little manger and sticking donkeys in there and some like Middle Eastern wise men and, uh, and some, some angels with questionable wings and whatever it is. Instead of that, they spent it waiting, hoping, praying, expecting that one day God would come. But they kept waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting. And there's this, incredible, there's this incredible story of a guy named Simeon. And the Bible says that Simeon is a believer who he spent, he spent his entire life serving the Lord. He loved the Lord. And he had been waiting his entire life, hoping that one day he would get to see the Savior the Messiah. And then the Bible says that there's one day, there's one day that he wakes up and he's praying and the Holy Spirit says, I need you to go to the temple. Now here's what I love about this, that because Simeon was praying and listening to the Lord, he knew what he needed to do. And so Simeon, that morning, he goes to the temple and that morning, he runs into he runs into two parents, Mary and Joseph, and they're holding a little baby named Jesus. And in this moment, the Holy Spirit confirms in his heart, he says, that's my Messiah. And in this moment, the Bible tells us that Simeon is so overjoyed because the hope that he's had in God is finally fulfilled. And the Bible says this. I love this. This is so so committed. Luke 2, verse 39, he prays. He says, Sovereign Lord, now let your servant die in peace because as you have promised, essentially, he just says, I have waited my entire life for this. And God, my hope was in you, and now I can die happy. See, there's, there's probably a lot of things in this life that you would put your hope in that even when they did arrive, you would not want to die. Like, I don't know that many of you are like, hey, I made my Christmas list this year. It's everything I've ever wanted. And once Christmas is over, I can die December 26th. I can die. That'd be fine, right? Now, I'm, I imagine none of you are there, right? Like, as soon, as soon as I open up that brand new video game, kill me. Because I've been satisfied, right? Like, most of you would not be ready for that, right? Most of you, most of you are probably really excited for the day that you finish middle school. How many of you are excited to finish middle school? Okay. How many of you, though, are ready to go, as soon as middle school is over, take me, Lord? Right? Now, here's the deal. Here's the deal. The reason why is because most of the things that we put our hope in in this world will never satisfy us. Most of the things that you put your hope in in this world aren't going to fill you. Like if you put your hope in the, the next generation console, it's not going to fill you. If you put your hope in an upcoming sports game, it's not going to fill you. Y your, team, your, your team, even if your team wins, you know what happens? You're like, we won. And then it's over, Right? Because everything that we put our hope in, maybe you're really excited about the new Spider-Man movie. And you just, you're like showing all your friends the, have you seen the new trailer? Have you seen, have you seen it? I haven't seen it. No spoilers. I, I, I'm just waiting, okay? 
But maybe you're super excited. You're like, this is going to be the best movie of all time, and you can't wait. And we're going to get there. You're going to get there, and you're going to get, and you're going to watch Spider-Man. And even if it is great, the movie's going to finish, and you're going to be like, okay, cool. What's coming next? You know why? Because none of the hopes that we have in this earth will ever be fulfilled. We're still longing for something else. My favorite quote of all time is if we find within us a desire uh, that cannot be satisfied in this world, it means that we were made for another world. And we find that there's these desires that are in our hearts that we can hope in, but none will fill you the way that Jesus can. See, Christmas is a reminder that we have hope in Jesus, but it's more than that. Here's what I'm so excited about. Because the word Advent, right, what does it mean? Coming, right? It means the coming of Jesus, the arrival of Jesus. But guess what? God promised, God promised that one day he would would finally destroy Satan. Has that happened? Now, he... He defeated him, but Satan isn't destroyed yet. God, God promised that, that one day there would, no, there would be no more death or dying or pain. Has that happened? No, in fact, I wanna, um, I'm going uh, to look at some verses. Guys, I'm, I'm jumping all over. I'm going to look at those Revelation verses, right? The last two chapters of the Bible, God tells us a lot of things that are coming, and he makes these promises. Revelation 21.1, he says, there's going to be a new heaven and a brand new earth. Verse 3 and 4 says, God's home is now going to be among his people. They will be his people. God himself will be with them. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or sorrow or crying or pain. These things will be gone forever. How many of you are looking forward to a day when there's no more death, there's no more crying, there's no more pain, there's no more sorrow, there's no more injury, there's no one that you love that gets hurt, there's no one who hurts you, there's none of that, it's all gone. How many of you are looking forward to that day? The Bible says that God is going to make, verse 5, I am making everything new because it's, and he says, I am trustworthy and true. I, it is finished. He says, to all who are thirsty, I will give freely from the springs of the water. All who are victorious will inherit all these blessings. They will, I will be their God and they will be my children. There's going to be a day where you will have desires that will always be satisfied. Like everything that you long for will be satisfied in Jesus. You're thirsty, but there's a river of life that's constantly satisfying you. How many of you are looking forward to the day when all of your desires are finally met? Right? It's not like, it's not like when you have a crush on somebody and they don't have a crush on you back and you're just waiting. <sighs> Right? It's not like, it's not like when you have trained so hard for one moment in a game and then your team blows it. Right? It's not like that moment where you're super hungry and you get home and there's no food. That all your desires are met. Verse 22, I saw no temple in the city for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb whose Jesus are its temple. And the city has no need of sun or moon for the glory of God illuminates the city. The Lamb is its light. The nations will walk in it. The kings of the world will enter the city in all their glory. And essentially, here's what happens, that we don't even need, we don't even need a sun anymore. And I know that's like a weird phrase. There was never a moment in your life that you probably walked outside and you were like, the sun, I hate you. You're the worst thing that has ever happened to us, right? There's probably not been that moment. Maybe you got really sunburned one time and you were like, okay, you were like walking awkward and you're like, I hate the sun, right? You know, like maybe there was that moment. But the reality is that the sun is partially responsible for the destruction of everything in the universe, right? Because not not essentially the whole universe, but really our solar system. One, it provides life for us. If we didn't have the sun, you would all be dead, right? But part two is the sun is constantly breaking everything down around you. It's breaking everything. But what the Bible says is that in in the new heaven and the new earth, nothing will ever fall apart anymore. Nothing will ever be destroyed. 
And he says that all the nations will come in. Essentially, here's the thing. You ever get upset by the division among people? You ever get upset when you look around and everybody's fighting each other? You ever get upset about that? And he says there's going to come a day when the nations all agree that Jesus is king. We're all on the same page on this. How many of you are looking for the day when nobody's fighting anymore? There's no more destruction. There's no more death, no crying, no pain, no suffering. Are we looking forward to that day with hope? Now, here's the deal. Here's the deal. Guess what? None of that has happened yet. But it's coming. See, the reality is the God who, who, the God who, who kept his promises the first Christmas who promised that he would send us a son, and he did, is trustworthy and true. Which means this, that when Christmas comes around, it's not just a reminder that a baby was born 2,000 years ago, although he was. And although, although we know that a baby came 2,000 years ago and grew into the man Jesus and died on the cross and paid for our sins and rose again, the beauty is that the, the season of Advent Christmas is the reminder that Jesus is also coming back. And not only is he coming back, but when he does, he's going to make all things new. When he comes back, everything that was promised will be fulfilled. When he comes back, see, Christmas is a beautiful reminder that you have a God who keeps his promises. And he hasn't forgotten you. And that there's hope because there's more coming. See, the best hasn't happened yet. Did you know that? Like maybe you got really excited when the PS5 and the Xbox One X753, whenever that thing came out, you got really excited. Maybe you got like really pumped when they announced like a Switch Pro. Maybe you got really excited when they were like, we're going to make 500 more Marvel movies. And you were like... <gasps> Maybe you got really excited when you, when you got past the first quarter of this year and you were like, man, three to go, right? Maybe you got really excited, but let me just say something. The best in your life has not yet happened yet. See, because the best moment is when we get to be with Jesus face to face, and the promise is he is coming back. And so here's the thing. My hope is that this would be a reminder of the hope that you have in Jesus. There's a, there, there's a verse in 2 Peter verse 3, sorry, 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9. It says, the Lord isn't really being slow about his promise as some people think. No, he's being patient for your sake. He does not want anyone to be destroyed, but wants everyone to repent. Here's the deal. Some of you are waiting and you're hoping for all of these things to be made right. And in your life right now, waiting is a struggle. Like in your life right now, fifth grade, sixth grade, seventh grade, eighth grade, it's tough. Like in your life right now, there's pain in your life that's real and you're waiting. You're waiting for this to be over. You're waiting for the next thing to come. Maybe there's a, there's a part of your life right now that hurts, that stinks, and you're waiting, and we're going, God, why can't you just come now and make it all better? Why aren't you here already? Why, why am I going through this thing? And we think maybe sometimes that God is being slow, but the Bible tells us he's not slow. He's waiting. He's not being slow. He's waiting. And when we come into Christmas, it's a reminder that we're still waiting. And here's the beautiful thing. A few verses after that. 2 Peter 3, verse 14, I'm going to close with this. And so, dear friends, while you are waiting for these things to happen, make every effort to be found living peaceful lives that are pure and blameless in his sight. While we're waiting, while we're waiting, trust God. While you're waiting, spend your life on God. Spend your hope on Jesus. Don't waste your life craving things that will never satisfy. Jesus is the only thing that will satisfy your desires. And the promise is, the reminder is that as we come to Christmas, we get to wait and expect hopefully 
that Jesus will come. And when he does, everything's going to be made right. And so while we wait, we don't, we don't live in fear and anxiety. I don't know if it's going to work out. I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know. I'm scared of everything. We don't live like that. We live with hope that we have a God who is true and he's trustworthy. So live peacefully, full of hope. Live pure and blameless. Let me pray for you. Father God, I thank you for J-Box this morning. I thank you for every fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth grader who's pressing in right now to hear you, to know you. Father God, I pray that hope would rise in their hearts. Father God, I pray that they would, they would, um, they would grow a new hope this morning that longs for you and craves for you. God, there's all kinds of things in this world that we want, that we desire. We're not saying today that those are, those are bad, those are evil. We're just saying that, God, our full hope needs to be in you. And Father God, I pray that as Christmas comes around, that we are reminded, reminded that you're a God who keeps your promises, that we don't ever give up, that we trust that you are true. In Jesus' name, amen.